he helped shape the definitive sound of Americana. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Aaron Copeland. Copeland was born in Brooklyn in November of 1900 to a Jewish family of Lithuanian heritage. He was never physically strong as a kid. In fact, he was more of a bookworm. His parents ran the shop that they lived above, and his mother in particular was very keen on getting Aaron and his siblings music lessons of any and all kinds. All of them had taken after their mother in their musicality to some extent or another, and Aaron was duly started on the piano. Before he was even nine years old, he was already trying to sketch out some early songs, but these don't survive. There's a good chance that he never even wrote many of them down. Most of his training was as a pianist, but he did dabble in the compositional world that was to define his life. And composition did indeed become his life when he was 15 years old, after he had attended a concert given by the Polish composer-pianist Ignacy Paderewski. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Some of these Polish names really give me a hard time. The issue was that, not too far removed from the turn of the century, there weren't a lot of options for a young, up-and-coming American composer like Copland. His first attempt at learning the ropes came through a harmony course taken via correspondence. But there were a few composition teachers, such as the Viennese-trained Ruben Goldmark, who went on to become one of the first faculty members at Juilliard when they opened their school of music in the 1920s. He was able to give Copland a rundown of the basics of the craft, and Copeland would go on to study under Goldmark for four years. Although Copeland knew that Goldmark was more of a late romantic kind of guy, which was rather at odds with the kind of music that he wanted to write. This affinity for the past is one of the reasons why Goldmark, a lauded composer in his day, was so quickly dropped from programs after his death. Copeland knew that he needed more training, and so he sought out all available teachers. Instead of college, he went to Europe to study, and while there, he met the esteemed Mademoiselle Nadia Boulanger. She was just the professor that Copeland needed at the time. She could handle any style of music so long as it was good music. Most importantly, it was her approach that helped him refine his own music. She had an enormous breadth of knowledge, and she believed in Copeland's talent. This time in Paris turned into his equivalent of college. He spent time there studying the language, learning as much as he could about the culture, and hanging out with other American expatriates. But Copeland wasn't going to stay abroad for long, and soon enough he found his way back to the United States. He believed that American music had a future, and he very much wanted to be a part of this future. From his base in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, he was essentially a freelancer. He survived off of the frugality of his checkbook and his versatility as an artist. He continued associating with like-minded artists, which in turn helped him to refine his own style relatively early on in his career. Those in his circle included the photographer Alfred Steiglitz, husband of the famous painter Georgia O'Keeffe, and his view was that American art should reflect something of the democratic values of the melting pot of American society. But the sad truth was that there wasn't much of a history of serious art music being written in the United States. Charles Ives was still alive, and he was in the area, but he was no longer writing music actively, and in any event, Copeland didn't find him to be a suitable point of departure. Like George Gershwin, who was just recently coming off the success of Rhapsody in Blue, Copeland reached into the American vernacular to incorporate jazz into his mature music. But in those days, jazz had such a broad definition that what Copeland thought of as jazz is what we think of as more akin to ragtime. It focused mainly on the stratification of rhythmic irregularities. So you would have different kinds of sub-meters pulling and pushing against an underlying pulse. You would have groups of eighth notes that would be at odds with whatever quarter note pulse was underneath it. And by layering these, you could achieve various polyrhythmic effects, or at least polymetric effects. So Copeland was actively reaching for a European-centric style of art music that also took into account things that came from American culture, which is exactly what Antonin Dvorak said needed to happen if America was to hope to develop its own school of music. Copeland found this American sound, at least initially, by taking different collections of eighth notes and juxtaposing them against a more regular pulse. In any event, 1924 
had his first big hit in the form of the Symphony for Organ and Orchestra. At the premiere, the conductor Walter Damrosch, a proponent of Gershwin, said of the 23-year-old Copeland that if he's writing symphonies like that now, within five years he'll be ready to commit murder. Kind of harsh words out of context, but I think it was meant as a compliment. And in any event, Copeland's career prospects were looking up. But the Depression hit, and artists feared that their professions would be the first to go. But not if Copeland had anything to say about it. He took matters into his own hands and helped bandy together his compositional colleagues to form a more cohesive group. Though he struggled to make ends meet as much as anyone else, he was the first to go above and beyond at helping composers even younger than he was. He worked with Roger Sessions on a series of concerts devoted to premiering works by young American composers. He was also influential in the founding of a publishing house called Cos Cobb Press, which would go on to publish many works by neglected American composers. In a time of enormous upheaval, he was a steady rock for American music, and it was this reputation that grew and grew, and eventually he was called the Dean of American Composers. But nobody could possibly ignore the effects wrought by the Great Depression, and Copeland's musical style went through a sea change because of it. He was a part of an avant-garde that believed that difficult music per se, really wasn't a thing that existed. Rather, composers who wrote more dissonant and angular pieces just needed to write enough of it and get it in front of enough audiences in order for it to be accepted. The Depression was a crossroads because composers had fewer opportunities to put this difficult music in front of the public, so they had to ask themselves a difficult question. They could continue on towards atonality, or they could turn back and write pieces that audiences more wanted to hear. On one hand, you had Schoenberg and his famous 12-tone technique, and on the other hand, you had the challenge of taking something that was more popular and accessible and turning that and really crafting it into something of very high quality. Amongst the composers in Copeland's circle, there was about a 50-50 split. Eventually, Copeland would settle on writing in the more popular idiom, the more Copeland-esque sound that we're all used to and we've all heard but not before he reached an apotheosis of the more angular and dissonant style in his 1930 piano variations. This was an absolutely polarizing work amongst those who knew it. Leonard Bernstein would later go on to claim that whenever he needed to clear out a room at a party, he'd just find the nearest piano and bang out a few measures. Copeland was a very able pianist himself, as he'd started out on the instrument in his earliest days, and while in Europe, he'd actually taken some lessons from Ricardo Vignes, who had premiered various difficult works by the Impressionists, such as Ravel and Debussy. But despite this, Copeland had no aspirations towards concert pianism, and he had other composers and pianists play through his works so he could proofread them. He could hear them from a third-party perspective, without having to worry about making sure he's playing the notes right. Vivian Fine helped him in this regard for the piano variations. He was highly attached to the piece, saying in the 1970s that he felt like it was the first piece that was really, truly, and authentically him. But in the early 30s, Copeland was deeply dissatisfied and began writing music that was more accessible to the public, out of fear that composers who wrote more difficult music would end up writing music in a vacuum. After a few pieces that were intended for younger audiences, Copeland emerged with El Salon Mexico, an orchestral work based on various Mexican dance tunes. But it wasn't until he turned his pen towards subjects that exemplified Americana that his career really began to take off. The first was a ballet called Billy the Kid, and then its follow-ups Rodeo, sometimes pronounced Rodeo, but I think that sounds kind of stupid, and, of course, Appalachian Spring. These served to cement his place as a composer whose music exemplified Americana, and more specifically the American West, even though Appalachian Spring doesn't by its title. He tended to use a lot of wide-open spaces and intervals in his music, which a lot of people associated with the sounds of the American West. This is even more true if one takes the free-spiritedness and open landscapes of the American West and use it as a metaphor for American freedom writ large. Appalachian Spring was written on a commission from the modern dancer and choreographer Martha Graham, who also gave the piece its title. Copeland simply wrote music for a ballet for Martha. He didn't actually intend for it to capture any sense of Americanism. Despite his use of a shaker folk tune within the piece, it was not his intention to capture springtime in Appalachia. And when people would come up to him and tell him how much they really felt like they were there 
in the mountains as things bloomed around them and storms came over the horizon, he never had the heart to tell them that he never actually was thinking about that when he wrote the music. Not only that, but the title actually comes from a poem by Hart Crane, where spring refers to not the season, but like water coming up from the ground. In any event, these are all tonal pieces. They're all much more simplistic in their style and approach, and they're not the kind of dissonant and angular modernism that came to define many of Copeland's colleagues. And now we see an open acknowledgement of a split. Some composers thought that if a piece had wide popular appeal, it could not also have high artistic merit. His modernist colleagues had gone so far down the rabbit hole that they didn't accept the fact that a piece could be good and also loved by audiences, and this is still a problem that we're having today. But it got so bad that even otherwise tonal composers were afraid that their greatest champion was somehow selling out. Copeland was, as you might imagine, completely aggravated by these statements, saying in effect that composers should not be afraid of audiences, because the audiences were kind of why they were there in the first place. This paralleled, although to a much less extreme degree, the style of socialist realism that was pushed upon composers in the Soviet bloc. The underlying justification for both was that music should be understandable to the average person, although the Soviet authorities used it as a cudgel against composers they just personally didn't like. Whereas with Copeland, no one was forcing him to do this. It was much more an inner artistic conviction. It is perhaps one of the greatest of ironies in the history of Western music that the composer who is seen as exemplifying Americana and American culture was so distinctly un-American in many stereotypical ways. He was part of many groups and circles that for many years were not considered part of mainstream Americana, for whatever that term's worth. He was not an immigrant himself, but he was the son of immigrants. He was of Jewish heritage. He was a communist sympathizer, about which more in a second, and he was gay, which was more or less an open secret. His most notable fling was probably with Leonard Bernstein, and they would remain friends and colleagues for the rest of their lives. But he felt no urgency to be an icon of the gay community, even as social movements toward acceptance gained a foothold in the latter years of his life. He just wanted to be himself, and he didn't want to be out there as a figurehead. All taken together, the fact that Copeland, with this very non-traditional and non-mainstream background, created such music for the mainstream, speaks to the idea that the mainstream doesn't really exist always in the way we imagine it to. If you take Copeland to be the quintessentially American composer and a pioneer of a quintessentially American sound, then all of a sudden that sound takes on a new light and a new context. It formed a central role in what America was and what America was still becoming. For the first time, Americans could point to their own popular musical hero who could stand up to the greats of other lands. Widely spaced chords and syncopations and rhythmic intensity define much of his mature music, regardless of what style he was writing in. But actually quantifying what made Copeland's music Copeland's music, what gave it the Copeland sound, is still not really well understood or well known amongst the theoretical community. There's a sense of je ne sais quoi, as the French would say, that gives Copeland's music a distinct flavor. There's a distinct characteristic that he was able to capture that no one else has really been able to recapture. Tonal organization in Copeland is a theorist's minefield, and many don't seem to want to touch the subject, because while his music is very clearly tonal in that it establishes clear pitch centers, it does not use these in particularly traditional harmonic progressions or contexts. Especially in his Americanist works, there is a strong pull of diatonic writing, but once you start trying to boil it down and figure out how he's handling the movement of one pitch center to another, all of the established rules of being able to boil that down seem to fall apart. In many ways, the popular and largely constant style of writing that at the same time resisted any and all theoretical approaches reminds you a bit of the works of Debussy with his non-functional harmonies. Although Copland and Debussy are two vastly different composers, Copland's writing tends towards more hard-driving rhythmic structures and melodies, and a preference for harsher sonorities. Another irony is that his output of popularly inclined Americanist works was more or less restrained to the 1940s. 
By the time the 1950s had rolled around, he had come into contact with the post-war serialist school, and became interested in seeing how he could refine and adapt Schoenberg's 12-tone technique and its various mathematically informed descendants into his own music. Although, like Igor Stravinsky, he always found a way to make it sound like his own style, even if he was using the 12-tone technique. He used it not as an end, but rather as a means to an end, which is sort of what Schoenberg wanted people to do in the first place. This streak of individuality and in going his own way also crops up in his film scores of the era. His film scores are sometimes seen as anti-film scores in that they don't necessarily follow the traditional formulas of where to place the music or how to write the music in relation to different characters and their interactions. He just turns that on its head and sees what comes out of it. This experiment in abnegating everything traditional about the film score actually won him an Academy Award for Best Original Score in 1949 for the film The Heiress. The aforementioned split between composers and their audiences was only widening, and this was not helped by the serialists who decided to deride the more popular 1940s Copland pieces. Copland busied himself listening to a lot of composers around the world and not liking a lot of what he heard. He found electronic music rife with sameness, and he thought that chance procedures a la John Cage were antithetical to what composition was, finding the right notes in the right time and the right place. He did, however, as mentioned, find some seed of serialism to latch onto, in part because of all these newfangled techniques he thought it was the most adaptable to one's own personal style. And yet another irony, it was not just a staunch serialist who introduced him to the technique and showed him that it could be used to great creative potential. It was the staunchest serialist, none other than Pierre Boulez himself. And yes, this was the same Boulez who criticized any serialist composer who wasn't serialist enough. Copeland never became one of these hardliners and always was able to use it to his own advantage. Anyway, back to the communist thing. Copeland had always held a fascination for the Russian Revolution and its promises of egalitarianism. He openly supported communist candidates for president of the United States in the 1930s and published settings of communist poetry in communist magazines. But he never actually joined the roles of any far-left political party. That is, he was a communist, but not officially a communist. He was enough of a communist that the FBI actually did keep tabs on him, though. This was then turned over to Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy. Copeland was brought before Congress and systematically grilled by McCarthy and his cohorts, and it was revealed that he did occasionally keep in touch with the far-left organizations of his youth. As a result of this, Copeland cut off all ties to far-left-leaning organizations, especially after learning more fully of the Soviet Union's style of artistic repression, something he could not genuinely support. Support for Copeland poured out of the musical world. Even those who didn't like his music supported him because the idea that Copeland, of all people, was encoding anti-American sentiments into his very American music was just laughable. And indeed, it turned out that McCarthy had absolutely no freaking clue what Copeland had composed in the first place. That or he was being intentionally obtuse, which yeah, I wouldn't put it past the guy. The huge gap between what McCarthy thought Copeland believed and what Copeland actually composed was influential in keeping Copeland's career afloat. He didn't really suffer much at all, not when compared to other artists who were brought before Congress and grilled the same as he was. They suffered setbacks, whereas he didn't. The only real setback he did suffer was a potential performance of his piece, A Lincoln Portrait, which was cancelled. It was pulled from President Eisenhower's inauguration due to fears of Copeland being a communist. And then when you realize that a Lincoln portrait is just an orchestral piece with someone narrating different portions of text taken from Lincoln's speeches, then you realize that the entire thing is completely absurd. Like, what communist would write a piece about freaking Abraham Lincoln? Come on, man! Later in life, he found himself drawn to the world of conducting, partially because he wanted to be artistically involved, but he just didn't have any more juice left in the tank. He was out of inspiration for the most part. His ability to compose just seemed to fizzle away into thin air. He died in December 1990, having turned 90 just the previous month. He suffered from Alzheimer's disease in his later years, and it's speculated that the early effects of this condition led to his decreased output in composition, although the timing just doesn't seem to work out. His last significant work, that is one that's still in the repertoire, 
was his duo for flute and piano, which he finished up in 1971. His final work, a piece called Proclamation, was started in 1973 and only finished in 1982. Copeland was always very humble about what he did. His illuminating and insightful writings about music were referred to as byproducts. He referred to his eclectic and time-consuming process of composition as a mere assembling of materials, and he was almost embarrassed that he had to use the piano as a fundamental tool of his process until he learned that Stravinsky did the same thing, at which point he was proud of it. To some extent, he was almost bashful about being in the rarefied era of the all-time greats of music. He said that his process was a lot like mining and that he would have an idea, or several ideas, and then he would put them into different contexts and try to combine them, and he would end up writing different sections of a piece that he'd then glue together at the very end. He remained a staunch advocate of new music, of his generation and of all younger generations. He inherited the technique from Mademoiselle Boulanger of getting inside what a piece needed to be, whether it was his piece or a piece of one of his pupils, and then figuring out what he called, plain and simple, the right note at the right time. This sparseness and this economy of means meant that he was always in favor of removing that which was not necessary, which meant that he often cut out large sections of his music. This gives his music a leanness and an efficiency that gives his music, well, its Copelandness, its sense of Americana, even if he wasn't trying to go for it. This also meant that he was a big fan of recycling material, such as his wartime fanfare for the common man written on commission, which he then plowed back into the finale of his epic Third Symphony. He was also humble in that he didn't think the commissioned fanfare had much of a life beyond its initial commission, when now the fanfare is more often played than the Third Symphony. His influence outside of composition was also profound, be it in his writings or his lectures or his other educational efforts. He taught at or was otherwise involved in the Tanglewood Institute in the Berkshire Mountains for over 25 years. He lent a weight and a gravitas from its very founding, and in his role, he thought it was his duty to bring in as many new voices as possible, even if he didn't understand what these voices were saying. He did not force his opinions on anyone else, and he invited even people such as Yanis Zanakis, pretty much the opposite of everything that Copeland was as a composer, except for the far-left political leadings, but he did this just to give the younger generation access to as much different music as possible just as he did in his later years. He didn't necessarily like electronic music or like John Cage, but he went out and he listened to it and he gave it a shot. Copeland proved to the world that it was possible to write great music that was also popular without being a sellout to commercialism. Though he was by no means the first American composer, he was, in some senses, the first American composer, even though it pains me as a great fan of Charles Ives to say that. Of his roughly 100 works, a good percentage of these are still in the repertoire, a far larger percentage than many other composers you can care to name. And no matter what style he wrote in, his voice was always clear and always distinct. He said that his wish was to see if he could say what he had to say in the simplest possible terms, and this pervades his early modernist works, his middle period American works, and his late period more serially inflected works. These were all offshoots of a core philosophy that brought American music a very unique sound. Mm -hmm. 